turn our attention to the youth, these really awesome people that I've had the chance to work with these past few months. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about climate education and climate anxiety, um, especially in the wake of uh, the bill that NEBEC has been working on that got two million in the Appropriations Committee of 1902. <laughs> <laughs> super amazing um, to see. But anyway, I will get to the questions now. And you guys, as you if you can introduce yourself, how many you feel free. Okay. How has the climate crisis personally affected you and have you experienced a decline in mental health due to the current state of our climate? Yeah, I guess I can go first. Hi everyone, I'm Kosi. Um, I'm really lucky and happy to be here with all of you today. And yeah, I guess in terms of my personal connection with the climate crisis, I am a first generation American. Um, my parents immigrated here from Nigeria uh, just a couple months before I was born actually. Um, and Nigeria was um, colonized by um, uh, Great Britain and in the process of what we would determine as decolonization and that country becoming an independent nation, um, there was still a lot of um, intertribal disagreements because boundaries drawn up by um, one small island across the sea does not really dictate the needs and the wants of the people groups that are actually living in those areas. Um, and the type of colonialism that was experienced um, by the people in that area was extractionary colonialism. There's a lot of natural resources um, in the continent of Africa as a whole, but also specifically in what we now call as Nigeria. Um, a lot of things like oil, um, oil's a really big major export. Um, so uh, the tribe that I'm from, I'm Igbo, so um, there was in, my homelands, there a lot of the um, a lot of the oil was in that area, and um, that uh, those resources were not properly being um, were not properly being uh, put back into those communities. And um, around in the nineteen sixties, uh, there actually was a civil war um, for uh, those people to try to get independence, but because. Um, of course, Nigeria still had colonial ties to um, Great Britain. Uh, Great Britain didn't really want them to have access to um, making their own profit and um, uh, promoting their own, um, essentially promoting, uh, ha making their own profit with um, their resources. So that caused a lot of intertribal warfare, as I said, a civil war, and Nigeria is still a colonial structure because the um, because Great Britain decided that they still wanted access to the resources that they have been exploiting for thousand, for um, hundreds of years. And so, in terms of my personal connection with the climate crisis, my question to myself is always, what's going to happen when those resources dry up? What's going to happen to my people um, when there is no longer any resources to be exploited. And that's something that I have to um, grapple with every day. And um, that's something that's experienced by um, a lot of indigenous peoples around the world. And also um, just that mindset of what's going to happen to my people when um, these issues persist. That's something that black people around the world have to grapple with as well. Um, something that Lakota was talking about last night um, about how even though things like solar panels are great, the resources that we need to build those solar panels need to come from somewhere and the ways that we are getting those resources to build these um, green infrastructures are not the best way. People in South Africa, for example, um, for to build solar panels, you need things like platinum. The platinum mines in South Africa are notorious for um, horrible working conditions for um, the workers there. And yeah, so I guess I guess that was a long tangent, but that's my personal connection with the climate crisis. So I'll pass that on to whoever wants to go next. Thanks for that, Kosi. Um, hi, my name is Madison Shepard. Um, again, I just want to uh, echo Kosi. It's great to see everybody here today. Um, 
And I grew up uh, by the ocean, so I experienced a lot of sea level rise um, and hurricanes, floods, you name it, it happened. Um, but it didn't really get severe until I moved up to Maine about six years ago. And uh, we had a series of storms last year, if anybody remembers. Uh, there was like a cluster of like almost three tornadoes forming. Um, one of which was right directly above the house that we lived in in Waterford, um, which I never thought that I would have to be afraid of a tornado living up in a mountain. Um, I thought I was safe from that, uh, but I was sorely mistaken. Um, and that caused a huge mental health spiral. Um, and this is something that I'm about to talk about might be a little uncomfortable for people who aren't used to talking about mental health, but it is very serious and it's very important. Uh, everybody deals with it. Um, and, and that was, I went through a huge anxiety lull. Um, not lull. I, hi, I'm talking and not very well. Uh, <laughs> um, basically, I was hospitalized about five times, um, having doomsday anxiety, um, not being able to eat. Um, all I could do was sleep because I couldn't handle being awake anymore because I was afraid that the world was going to end any minute and that those storms, that what's happening was going to come get me again. Um, over time, it got better. I ended up being able to focus back in my uh, work um, in climate action. Um, but it is something that is very serious and I am not the only person that has experienced this. And I can guarantee you that that is a very common experience among youth um, and among young adults that, uh, you know, we, we fear for our lives, we fear for our futures. It is, it is very serious. Yeah, um, I definitely agree with, with, with Maddie in terms of that feeling of fear for, for my future. Um, I am a sophomore, in, oh, my name's Audrey, by the way. Um, I'm from Denver, and And um, I'm, a, I'm a sophomore in high school right now. So the, the climate crisis, it is already happening, and it's only going to get worse if we don't do something about it right now. Um, and it's something that's going to be affecting, affecting my future, affecting all of our futures. Um, because, like, in, in 2030, um, I'm going to be 25. Um, so I, I'm going to just be starting my adult life, and the, the climate crisis is, at that point, going to, if, if we don't do anything, it's going to be extremely serious. And um, it, it's really, the impact that it's going to have on, on our futures is, is extremely severe. And... That has definitely caused me a lot of anxiety. Um, when I first learned about the climate crisis in middle school, um, I, I had to do a lot of research on my own because I didn't really have a lot of education in my school, which we'll, we'll talk about that more later. But doing that research I was and realizing what a severe crisis it was and how much it was gonna impact my future and the future of everyone in my generation, um, that, was, that was really scary. And as a, as a young person, as a middle schooler, um, I felt like I did, there was nothing I could do because I just, I felt so small and like I couldn't, like there was nothing that um, I could do to, to stop this. And that was, that felt really hard for me. So I, I definitely, I went through a period where it was just really hard. Um, I, I, I was really scared. I cried myself to sleep at night. Um, and it, what really helped me was when I started finding ways to reach out to other people um, and to take action on this issue to feel like I really was was doing something. So yeah, that's kind of my been my experience with, with climate anxiety. Hi, uh, my name's Luke. I come from Freiburg and um, I'm sure many of you in the area are familiar with the issue of Poland Springs uh, bulk extraction of water for bottling. Um, and that has been the way that my community has been most impacted by the climate crisis. It's not the um, one of the direct impacts, but the, rather the reaction to climate change by the capitalist economic system of privatizing necessary resources for human survival upon seeing the scarcity of that resource that climate change is causing. Because we're familiar with that, you know, climate change isn't... Um, 
it's not something that's affecting the future. It's not an abstract. It's not um, intangible. It is, m many of us have the, the luxury of considering, a, a not um, con thinking about how it will impact our futures when in fact for much of the world it has already caused uh, immeasurable damage and catastrophe. And uh, water scarcity or water insecurity is one of the existing um, severe impacts that climate change has caused. Uh, it's estimated that by 2025, about half the world's population is not going to have access to clean drinking water uh, on a consistent basis. And, uh, you know, corporations see this as, a, well, any of us in the room who have an aversion to human suffering might consider this a bad thing. Uh, corporate executives who are solely focused on profit see, as, see this as a tremendous market opportunity because people are going to be willing to pay as much as, as, as is necessary for such a vital resource. And so uh, when I was nine years old, I became aware of the fact that Poland Spring was entering our community and seeking uh, a very uh, a privileged contract with our town's private water supplier, um, extracting, essentially, having unfettered access to our aquifer and extracting uh, exorbitant amounts of water uh, with minimal return to the community and so that they could ship it to these expanding markets. Um, so I can say that uh, I'm fortunate in that I have not been directly impacted by the climate crisis as many of my fellow board members have. Um, but I am, we, are, we are still struggling with the, you know, no matter where you are, you're still going to be impacted by the economic system that has created and is um, exacerbating this, this crisis. I have had very minimal climate education. In middle school, we had a couple weeks um, where, we, where we talked about climate change, um, but in, in science class. But it was basically, it was just talking about um, just like how much um, CO2 can, can we have in the atmosphere, like how much warming, um, like what's like the threshold of warming that, that will prevent like huge disasters. But it didn't re we didn't really talk about the effects of climate change, and we definitely didn't talk about what people could do about it. Um, so I have found that like a lot of a lot of the other students my age don't really understand um, what how severe the climate crisis is, and I think that um, that it's, that's very important that people do understand, which is why I think climate education is is so important because people really do need to understand like what what a severe crisis it is. There's a friendly spider here saying hi to us right now. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, yeah, I was never really taught it in school. We were told that there was this thing called global warming and the ice caps were melting and the polar bears were in trouble. And that's all we were told. Um, and uh, when I went to the high school here, I'm gonna personally call out Oxford Hills High School right now. Uh, please don't sue me. Uh, <laughs> That, <laughs> that in freshman year, I was given a science teacher. His name rhymes with Schmartin, Mr. Schmartin. Um, and he told me, he told the class that climate change was nothing to worry about. And if anybody tells us so, um, that they are lying. Um, and I should be more afraid of solar flares than anything else. Um, which growing up, not knowing how much danger my future hold or held, um, I was more afraid of like quicksand. <laughs> You know, you know, they teach you about quicksand in science class, and you're like, oh no, I'm gonna run into quicksand one day and I'm gonna be in trouble. <laughs> Real dangerous people. This is the reality of the life we're living in. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, and then eventually during my senior year of high school, I had AP literature where I was allowed to do a research paper as a final project, and I chose to research climate change. And that was the only useful information I gained in high school, and it was on my own hand. And that's it. <laughs> um, yeah, my experience was very much similar in that uh, we, 
um, received very little formal education about the climate crisis and pretty much all of the knowledge I had was thanks to radical organizing spaces. Um, however, I was enrolled in uh, an outdoor education program that was very much focused on experiential learning. So we did spend a lot of time outdoors um, just you know, studying local ecosystems, and inevitably, uh, a lot of the consequences of climate change came up. So we would go into forests and see that trees were under extreme water stress due to drought. And we would talk about these new invasive species that were coming because of changing weather patterns. And, um, you know, we never explored those within the context of climate change, but the consequences of it were all around us. Uh, we also uh, frequently partnered with organizations uh, that are perpetrators in the climate crisis. We, on several occasions, had uh, our teachers partnered with Poland Springs and brought them into the classroom, who taught us about water stewardship, ironically. And uh, <laughs> yeah, they, all the while they were teaching us about, you know, water systems and how important it is to, um, you know, not to, you know, not to litter when they were responsible for creating billions of plastic bottles that end up choking the waterways and are privatizing water for private profit. You know, kind of, um, you know, not, they weren't exactly in a position of authority to be telling us what to do with the environment. Um, yeah, but our, the entire lens through which we studied the environment was very much through um, a position of possession and ownership, and that the ultimate goal of conservation and of land management was to make it as profitable as possible. We would go into forests, not to study the beautiful diversity of it, but to study the calculated board feet of lumber that could be cut from a tree. And as seventh graders, <laughs> not like what? <laughs> So um, it was, you know, we were indoctrinated with the idea that nature was to be extracted from and that our role, like the, o the only proper way to in interact with the environment, sure, we could, we could enjoy it from a distance, but we were, we were separate, we were superior to it. Um, and it would ultimately existed to serve us. So that's the lens uh, through which we were taught to look at the environment. Um, and not as this interconnected system which we all depend on for survival. Um, so, yeah. Cool, cool. Thanks for that, guys. And um, y'all want to know my experience. I grew up in Texas, so the answer is nine. No climate education. <laughs> um, so for the next question, I'm just going to ask two of you to answer, just whoever wants to. How do you see climate education helping youth manage climate anxiety? Um, I guess I can speak to that a little bit. Um, I really felt like for me, um, what really helped with my climate anxiety was being able to take action and finding ways to, to do something. So I really feel like that climate education, um, like it, it's really important for people to know, first of all, about the climate crisis because you can't take action about it unless you, you know the issue. Um, but I also think it's really important to include like ways, ways that people can, can do something, even if it's even if it's really small, like starting starting a climate action club at your school, uh, which I tried to do in middle school, it didn't work out very well. But um, it like those small things um, that that can really help, and then that can lead to, to, to bigger things and connect getting connected to to other organizations um, and to ways that, that you you can make a difference in your community. Um, so I feel like that's, that's a really big um, way that I feel like climate education can help students um, deal, deal with climate anxiety. Um, I second all of that very much. Um, and I've, I've said this many times before, and I'll, I'll say it again, is that it's kind of ridiculous that, you know, the people who are standing in the crossfire of this crisis is not being taught what's happening to them and what will eventually affect them. Um, so that's, that's my hot take on it. Um, uh, but also knowledge of the current crisis, um, not only will benefit those who are, um, you know, 
like standing in it and knowing what's going to happen, but you know, uh, people who want to take action, as Audrey said, um, in our capitalist society, it can you know create jobs uh, for people who want to go into uh, you know engineering, science, all that stuff, um, and yeah. the next two, if you'd like. Um, what do you wish adult allies would understand or do to help? Um, I guess, in short, that we are a lot more knowledgeable than people actually perceive us to be. Um, yeah, I mean, I've only, I'm saying only, I've been on this planet for almost 18 years now. But in that time, I have gained a wealth of knowledge from um, experiences with people around me, so on and so forth. And while we do learn from um, the older generations, um, uh, the older generations ahead of us, also I think it's really important that um, the generations ahead of us learn from us as well, um, because we have a lot to give. We have a you know youthful. Um, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed um, view of the world. And I think that's really important, especially when we're talking about solving the climate crisis. It's really important um, to have, I mean, yes, it is a lot of, um, there's a lot of anxiety around it. There's a lot of negative things around the climate crisis, but there is, we do need to have at least some sense of optimism. And I think that's what you do bring to the table is that sense of optimism because we have not been kicked down by the world so many times. Um, we're able to bounce back a lot quicker, and I think that's really important. Yeah, thank you, Josie. Um, I would say uh, making space, uh, just creating space for youth leadership is incredibly important because um, even in my role in organizing and trying to bring more youth into the environmental movement, the most effective way to bring people in is to make them feel that their, their role is important. Because it is. Because this is an all-hands-on-deck situation, and we need all the leadership and support that we can get. And, you know, making sure that people understand that there is space for everyone in the movement, no matter their interests, their abilities, their... Um, you know, their capacity to participate, whether they, you know, work two jobs in order to, or trying, you know, trying to feed a family or, um, you know, whatever their needs are, just working to make sure that there is space for them in the movement. Um, um, uh, meditation, therapy. <laughs> therapy is really important. I think everyone should go to therapy at least once in their life for a period of time. It's extremely important. Everyone in the crowd, everyone on Facebook Live, go to therapy. Um, <laughs> but that's what I would have to say, first and foremost. Um, and also just having a community, it's really important. Um, humans are social creatures. We thrive and um, survive with our communities. That's the way that we survive. So making sure that we have a nice, stable community um, is really important. And in terms of what I've been doing to help advance climate education um, for the past year, um, along with um, a lot of the other people on the panel, um, we've been working on the climate education bill that was just, was not fully funded, but, you know, funded a great amount um, uh, by appropriations yesterday. So, yeah, a little bit more cheers, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I'm a senior in high school, so I won't ever get to really experience the benefits of this bill, but I'm just really excited and really happy to know that some students will, and that's kind of what keeps me going in this. As, as Cozy said, having having a community, having other young people who, who care about this issue, um, that that's really helpful. Another thing that I try to do is find um, find little things to be hopeful about. Um, like the climate crisis, it can feel really big and scary, but like one of the things that makes me really hopeful is that, um, well, first of all, seeing all, so many young people who are, who are, um, who care about this issue of 
when people um, learn, uh, learn about this issue and when they're given a chance to take action. I've seen so many young people who really, um, who really are passionate and that gives me a lot of hope. And then also, the climate crisis is a really big issue and it's gonna require a lot of change, but it gives us a chance to kind of reimagine our future um, and create a future that, that, we, that we want um, and that will, that will really help, um, that will be a place where everyone can thrive. Um, so th those little things, they, they give me hope and that really helps me um, manage, manage climate anxiety. Um, and then in terms of the climate education, I've been working with um, COSI on the climate education bill, which is super exciting. Um, and I've also been working on um, uh, creating a climate justice crash course with Maine Climate Action Now um, that would provide resources for people, um, all, all people who, were who are interested to learn about climate justice um, and, yeah, the different components of climate justice. So, yeah. I would like to um, echo Audrey, Audrey on the um, uh, climate justice crash course thing again. Um, keep an eye out for that. That's going to be really important and helpful. And also wanted to echo Kosi, um, no shame in the med game, no shame in the therapy game. Uh, <laughs> um, it's, it's all a balance, personally. Um, you know, like, just like you have to balance out medication and therapy, there's also a balance of, like, you know, exposure to the outside, being able to know when you need to shut off your social battery and go inside and just sit down with a chocolate bar and hug your cats and watch camping videos. I know it's very niche, but trust me, it works. <laughs> um, along with taking action, um, personally, um, it, when I find this work gets too overwhelming, I like to create art. That is one of my outlets, and I feel like I can really put my emotions and frustrations out on paper, my sadness, my fear, whatever it is, um, once it translates onto paper or canvas or whatever you work with, um, it just feels, it feels a lot better to be like, okay, like, you know, I got that all out of my system. I created something physical with it. And it reminds you that like everybody that's in the crowd right now, you have the ability to take those emotions and turn it into something physical and make real change whether it is painting or going out to a rally or talking to your senators or your legislators or you know picking up trash whatever it is like we have the ability to do something and when we all think like that we all come together as one we are much more powerful that way um i would say one of my favorite quotes um that I like to uh, cite often is that I am um, a pessimist of the intellect and an optimist of the will. So we can accept the, the horrific situation we are in. We can understand that this system is not going to produce an effective solution to the climate crisis. It is not going to resolve white supremacy and the colonial the global colonial power structure but at the same time that our actions and our victories create and sustain hope that the solution is not going to come from this system but it is going to come from us it is going to come from the grassroots the power flows inward from the margins it flows upward that's a reality we are taught that uh, the people in Positions of power hold the power, but in fact, it is the masses of people who are affected by these, these issues, who hold the perspective, the lived experience that hold the power, and, um, you know, that with each action we take is a step closer to victory, and um, each victory generates hope, and, you know, that's how I've sort of dealt with it, that's how... Um, I've been able to justify my continued presence here is that we are we are making changes and that um, you know we're, we're moving in the right direction despite um, the odds we're against so yeah thank you